This is the lecture on computer security hardware for COMP 375, Computer Architecture and Organization at North Carolina A&T State University. We're getting to the end of the semester. There'll be two more lectures on security, this one and another, then a lecture reviewing for the final exam, and the final exam is scheduled for 8 a.m. bright and early on Thursday, May 7th. Please do the course evaluations for all classes. They're out on Blackboard. Computer security has a cost. It's a cost in hardware, software, and user convenience. It'd be really nice to just walk up to a computer and use it without logging in. But you don't want anybody else to walk up and log in and use it as you. Uh, how much security do you need is always the question. There's a certain amount of security you need to get, you know, keep everybody out. But if you really need to keep uh, things secret, it's going to take considerable effort. How much do you need to buy to make it secure? The question really is, how much is the information you're trying to save worth? Uh, in some companies, the information you have is all the company owns. If they lose it, they've lost everything. So the cost of defeating a security system must be greater than the value of the data it protects. That way, it's not worth an attacker's effort. And how much security you need depends on who is going to try to attack you. There's several different levels here. We have your ordinary web user. Now, this uh, Joe Sixpack out there surfing the web shouldn't be able to find information on your website that you don't want them to find. So that's the lowest level. And then there's sophisticated users. That would be computer science students. Uh, you need to be able to keep them out. And then, of course, the people who do it for fun and profit, the professional thieves, are going to go out there and try to steal things because they want to make money doing it. Another threat is an insider. That is somebody who works for the corporation or who just recently worked for the corporation might find it easy, at least they think it's easy, to steal things from the corporation. Uh, they're a little bit more difficult to protect against because they know information. They may know the keys to get into the system. Corporations themselves can put together an awful lot of effort because they have a lot of funding, but nobody has more funding than the government. And the government has lots of things they want to keep secret, uh, you know, bomb secrets and other sort of secrets they don't want other companies to get. So they can spend a lot of money on keeping things secret, and they can spend a lot of money on trying to get in if they think they need to. What do we want our computer security system to do? There are multiple goals you may want to achieve. The most obvious one is security, secrecy. You want to keep people out from looking at information they shouldn't be able to see. And you also want to keep them from changing it. You don't want people to be out changing information. I don't want students changing their grades on my computer. And authentication is logging in or verifying yourself to some website. You want to make sure that you can easily validate that it's you and not anybody else. Non-repudiation is the fact that you can do something and then you can no longer deny that you did it. Uh, this is useful in signing uh, contracts and such that you state that you're going to do it and nobody can say that you didn't do it. And of course, you want to keep the systems available. You don't want somebody to crash the system so you can't use it. There are different types of defense for computer security. Uh, cryptography is a tool that works in some cases, but it's not the end to computer security. Cryptography is the encoding information so people cannot read it. There's software controls such as antivirus systems. All computer systems should have an antivirus software on them. There are hardware controls. Frequently these are used for authentication such as smart cards, biometrics. Uh, and of course, don't forget the most obvious physical control controls. You need to lock the door so people can't get to your computer. If they can physically touch your computer, particularly if they can physically touch your computer and bring around a screwdriver, then there's an awful lot of things they can do. Uh, policies and procedures are extremely important, particularly in the industrial setting. 
who has the right to do something who has the information who knows the keys those are good policies uh, user education you need to make sure that people know how to use the tools that they have available there's an awful lot of tools available on Microsoft Windows for computer security most people don't use them and then there's the penalty of law it is now against the law to attack somebody's computer it wasn't always that case this guy with the gray beard can tell you there was a time when you could attack a computer and if you got the information good for you if you didn't they couldn't do anything about it your hardware has a significant amount of protection built into it there's privilege levels in your Intel Pentium system uh, four levels uh, level zero is the most protected that is the level that contains the kernel of your operating system level three is the least protected it's the used by users of the system the rest of the levels depend on what the software wants to do uh, usually level one is for non-kernel portions of the operating system uh, level three may be for other applications such as database managers uh, and there are all sorts of other uses for the multiple levels where you want to keep people out but don't give them the highest level of privilege there are some computer instructions that do not work unless you are level zero if you try to execute a start io command as a user you will get a privilege instruction interrupt there are four levels of computer privilege in the intel the log base 204 is two so it takes two bits as you can see there the io privilege level has two bits uh, to represent one of four privilege levels from zero one two and three still gotta remember your powers of two there will probably be a question about powers of two in the final exam memory in your intel and most computer systems is kept separate by the virtual memory system the paging system prevents you from seeing the memory of other users the paging system of most modern computers have an execute inhibit bit that is they have a bit that says this page cannot have instructions fetched from it remember this instruction fetch is they go pick up the instruction before they execute it uh, you can pick up data or possibly just read information from a page it can be a read-only page that you can't change you can only read and then there are pages where you can put data but you cannot fetch instructions if you try to do so then there'll be an interrupt the operating system gets control prints a nasty message and terminates your program the execute inhibit is particularly useful for preventing buffer overflow attacks cryptography is the skill of scrambling up a message so it can't be read unless somebody has the proper key to unscramble it uh, typically we start with what's called plain text now plain text doesn't have to be text it can be a picture it can be a document it can be a program we'll just call it plain text because bits are bits it doesn't matter what it is as far as encryption is concerned we're going to have the plain text go into an encryption algorithm along with a key and out comes ciphertext and ciphertext looks like random bits to the observer and then that goes into a decryption program along with an appropriate key and out comes the plain text which should be exactly identical to the plain text that went in and so in the middle the ciphertext can be transmitted over a network or stored in a file and so nobody else can see it unless they have the proper decryption program and the proper key you can use different encryption for different media uh, we often use encryption to send information over a network and again you can also use it to keep information secure on your computer there are basically two different flavors of encryption there's symmetric key encryption or asymmetric key encryption frequently symmetric key encryption is called secret key encryption and asymmetric is public key encryption note that does not mean that public key is less secure than secret key they're just two different ways they operate 
The big difference is whether the key to encrypt is the same as the key to decrypt. In symmetric key, both keys are the same. The key you use to encrypt the information is the same as the key you use to decrypt the information. So you have to pass the key secretly and in a secure manner to the person who's going to decrypt it. Of course, if you're both the person who's going to encrypt and decrypt, you just have to remember the key. In asymmetric, the keys are different. They are related, but they are different keys. Therefore, you can uh, give everybody the public key and you keep the secret key. And therefore, people can encrypt things and only you can decrypt them. Here's an example of how secret key encryption might work. You have uh, plain text on the left going into the encryption algorithm along with a secret key. Out comes the ciphertext, which you can send across the network or store on a disk. Later, when you want to see the information, uh, you take that ciphertext, run it through a decryption algorithm with the same secret key, and out comes the plain text. So both keys are the same, the encryption key and the decryption key. Uh, Popular algorithms for secret key encryption would be DES, the Data Encryption Standard, and AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. Asymmetric or public key encryption uses two different keys, one key to encrypt information and another key, a different key, to decrypt the information. Again, the plain text goes into the algorithm along with the public key and it encrypts it and becomes ciphertext, which you can store in a file or send across the network. On the other side, the person will have to use the private key to decrypt it. Uh, the popular algorithms for asymmetric or public key encryption are RSA and Lipid Curve Cryptography. The answer is D, none of the above. No, the operating system doesn't use encryption to keep you from seeing the memory of other users. It uses the page tables and other security hardware aspects. Another one of old Dr. Williams' trick questions. It's best he gets this out of the system before the final exam. Uh, RSA encryption is slow. Uh, it's at least significantly slower than DES or AES, which are symmetric key encryption. So as a general statement, public key encryption is slower than secret key encryption. DES and AES are relatively easy to implement in hardware. Uh, AES can be efficiently implemented in software. There are hybrid encryption systems that use both. They start by using public key encryption and then the only information they send across is a secret key. So having encrypted the secret key, sent it to the other side who decrypts it with the public key, then you now have shared secret keys and the rest of the system uses the secret key for communicating. The longer the key is, the harder it is to brute force a solution. Imagine your key was very short, say it was only three bits long. Well then, it only requires two to three or eight guesses. So you could try all eight guesses, or all eight possible keys, and see which one looks like it gives you an answer. Typically, all but all the keys, except for the right one, will give you garbage. The right one will give you something that works. So you need to have a long key. Some of the algorithms have keys that are sufficiently long. Others, the key is not long enough. Uh, in asymmetric algorithms, uh, such as public key encryption, there is a mathematical relationship between the keys. So not every bunch of bits works correctly as a key. And so those keys have to be longer because it doesn't allow you to use every possible combination of bits. In secret key, you can, in general, use any bunch of random bits you want as a key, although there are some bad keys. You don't want uh, a string of zeros that is 16 or more bits in a row, although that's uh, not very likely. Well, how likely? Uh, 2 to the 16, or 1 out of 65,000. DES, the data encryption standard, which was the basic 
algorithm for encryption for many years uses a 56-bit key. Uh, that's thinking to be kind of short. Uh, to get around that problem, we now use triple DES, sometimes called DES3, and it uses two DES keys. Even though, yes, it's triple encryption, it uses just two keys. It uses one key, then the second key, then the first key again. So it encrypts it three times using the three different key, uh, two different keys. Uh, AES, the advanced encryption standard, has different key lengths it can use, because 128-bit, 192-bit, or 256-bit keys. Uh, RSA, the public key algorithm that's most commonly used, uses variable length keys. They're frequently 512 bits, 1,000 bits, or 2K, and often 4K sometimes. So they're using very long keys. The answer is A, symmetric key encryption. Because if you're going to encrypt it, and then you are going to decrypt it, you want to be able to use the same key to make it easy. Also, symmetric key encryption is faster than asymmetric key encryption. DES has 56-bit keys. And a lot of people thought that was too short. Some people thought that the NSA, National Security Agency of the United States government, was involved in keeping the key short enough so that they could break it. But that's just a rumor. Uh, in, oh, about, what was that, 20 some years ago, an uh, organization built a hardware device that could brute force DES keys in a little more than two days. Now, of course, you can do it on your laptop in just a couple hours. So DES all by itself is not considered to be secure because it can be brute force uh, defeated. There are a couple of different encryption methods. The same encryption algorithm can be used in different ways, and they provide different levels of security. The most obvious one is what they call the electronic cookbook mode or ECB. Electronic book cookbook mode is a block cipher. That is, you take a block of text, uh, often 64 bits, and then run it through the algorithm with a key, and out comes another block of cipher text. If you, then you do it for the next block of 64 bits, and keep going, and so each one's uh, encrypted independently. The thing to remember, though, that if the plain text block one and plain text block two are identical, then the ciphertext will also be identical. They have to be the same because otherwise they wouldn't go back to the plain text correctly. So each block is encrypted separately. Stream ciphers are an alternate way to encrypt the information, even if you're using the same encryption algorithm. In this system, uh, the plain text exclusive ord with the ciphertext from the pre previous block. Here, plain text block two it's exclusive or bit for bit exclusive or with the ciphertext from the first block. And then after you exclusive or them together, they are encrypted with the regular key. And out comes ciphertext block two, which is exclusive or with plain text block three and so forth. The whole process is started where plain text block one, if it's the first block in the whole system, with an initialization or a random number that starts the whole thing. So you exclusive or with a random number. The random number, of course, has to be the same number to decrypt it. So typically, the random number is kept in the file or it's transmitted first with the system along with the encrypted text. Uh, so block ciphers, again, same input, same output, which can give a lot of information to the cryptanalysis if somebody's trying to break the cipher. Uh, with stream ciphers, uh, it all is different. There's a beginning value or initialization vector that's used to start the stream encryption. Here's an interesting example I got from Wikipedia. We have the picture on the left, and then here it is encrypted possibly with block mode. And while all the colors and everything are different, if we imagine that each block is encrypted to a different, uh, each block encrypts the same ciphertext for that input. So the white parts all come white, the black parts all become black, and so forth. 
and you can see here that you can still see the image in the block. We're in stream mode, it's completely random. You can't tell anything from the picture. It's important that you use your encryption system correctly. You should always use Cypher Block Chaining or CBC mode encryption. Public key encryption systems use B, two different keys. One key for encrypting, one key for decrypting. A lot of systems provide encryption of your entire disk, either through hardware or software. In the Microsoft world, uh, you can use BitLocker to encrypt all the information on your disk of your laptop. There's also hardware to do this. So the hardware encryption device connects to the bus and encrypts everything, all the data portions of the information going to the disk drive. Typically, there's an external key or a USB key that you plug into your machine and then everything goes encrypted. There's been a lot of stories of people losing their laptops that have valuable data. Uh, and so if you encrypt all the information, and of course you don't keep the encryption key with the laptop and lose it at the same time, then if somebody steals the laptop, there's no way they're gonna to get to the information on the laptop. Also, there are uh, several removable disk drives or external disk drives where you can plug in via a USB plug and they will encrypt your data. In this example here, the device plugs in through a USB 3 uh, and USB 3 is pretty quick. You can get the information across the USB channel relatively quickly and then uh, before it works, so you have to enter the key on the keypad. Please be sure you complete the online course evaluations for all your classes.